Okay, time to release the stinky birds. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to start on this end and see if we can get them all moved down to the far end. The majority of them moved anyway. And we'll close this middle divider to get them all concentrated. Uh, except, looks like except for one. Spook him over there. There we go. So I got them all concentrated in the front end. Uh, that should help. And uh, water was good. Here we go. Oh boy, and they're talking now. There we go, last of them. Some of them aren't quite feathered enough to fly well. I don't know how well they'll do getting away. But uh, it's a nice release. Not sure if you can hear them, but it's really cool to be surrounded by them all peeping and chipping, calling to each other, trying to cover you up. And uh, again, with regard to habitat, so this is a, a, a really great spot to release them and, and surrogate them because we're literally surrounded on three and a half sides by uh, great habitat. So they're able to release and then immediately hide. Now they'll scatter throughout the day, um, but hopefully they'll come back to the feed. And it's not uncommon to see them come right back to the feed uh, that we put out. Now well, the last step after releasing the birds and loading it up, and that's one of the reasons I like the Surrogator XL, the whole shoot match fits in the back of a truck. Uh, but the last step for me and, uh, is to load up the feeder and uh, get this feeder set up. Still have a game camera on it if you're interested to see. Um, we've actually seen the birds coming up already and feeding here, but what I did was I took the extra feed out of the surrogator dumped it on the ground there and then filled it up with filled the feeder up with scratch and so we should know in a week or so last time uh, I had birds for three or four days and then they disappeared um, when I did, did the same thing after the last release so I'll be interested to see uh, what happens this time I took the remainder of the feed that was in the surrogator the chick feed and then tried to fill the feeder tube as much as possible and then topped it off with some good old scratch um, and then poured some on the ground so they'll come back to it. I also tried something new too. I took uh, two or three coffee cans worth of scratch and just it out in the uh, brush here where all the birds are. You can still hear them peeping and uh, you can... <laughs> it's just surrounded by birds peeping at me. Um, so anyway, I tossed out a bunch of feed into, into the grass to see if that'll help them out a little bit as well. It's just so dry um, that uh, it's going to make it tough to, for a bird to find food out here. Okay, rule number one of power washing, always be upwind. Uh, you're power washing chicken poop or quail poop off of the bottom, so uh, don't do it upwind. And so now we're going to see how uh, a grown man and a 12-year-old girl unload the surrogator and power wash it. A little bit more. Okay, you come right here where I am. Come around me. Come around me. There you go. Okay. I'm going to let it down this way so we can handle it. There we go. Okay. Okay. Right there. And set it right like this. Uh, the majority of the spray is going to go this way. Are you good? No, I can't read. Good? Okay. Come this way. Right. 
Here, back up a little bit. <coughs> don't, don't ever drop it on me, okay? So we're standing upwind, wind's blowing this direction. The, really the parts that need power washing the most are the underneath, and uh, that's about it. There's not a whole lot that they mess up other than that, but we'll give it a good dose. And uh, I, use an, I use an inexpensive uh, Campbell Hallsfield uh, electric guy that you, it has 1.3 gallons per minute and 1,350 PSI. It was a hundred bucks um, and uh, plugs into a hose and an outlet and you're good to go. Isn't that for government work and baby quails? So I don't know if this is going to be the last cycle of the season or not. If it was, I'd load it back up in the truck and take it home. Um, it may be that we get the chance to get another batch of quail, so I'm going to leave it here in the barn <clears throat> at the ranch. It's still in good shape to run one more cycle, but uh, like I said, you can see the, uh, there's some paint flaking off and some rusty spots and, and some screws have gone missing. So it definitely needs to come in for some rehabilitation this winter. Uh, one of the things that I like about the surrogator is, as you see, it is easy to clean. Um, and could I make my own? Absolutely. Uh, could I make one that, that has lasted two years and this easy to clean? Man, that would be tough to do. One of the more unpleasant parts of raising wild quail is that you got to clean the surrogator after you've completed each cycle. Um, it's pretty straightforward. The surrogator XL breaks down into two pieces and transports easily in the back of a truck. Uh, they're not horribly nasty birds, but you, cleaning all of the quail poop off the bottom of the surrogator makes it nice for the little babies. And since we are putting small babies in there, we want to give them as much of an advantage as possible. Uh, it also gives you a chance to inspect underneath and, <clears throat> and I can see where I have to do a little bit more work with a wire wheel and some paint this fall uh, or winter uh, because the paint's peeling back and, and I don't want the bottom sides of the surrogator to rust. Um, I use an inexpensive Campbell Hossfeld uh, sprayer. I think it was about a hundred bucks, um, 1,350 PSI. Um, it, it, you know, you don't need a giant power washer if you don't have one. Um, and I just use, you know, straight water pressure with the, the power behind it. Um, it. It's got an attachment for soap and that kind of stuff, but you know, let's hit it a lick, clean it up as good as we can and, and uh, get the new quail loaded. You know, I, I, I can't say it enough. The surrogators are really well made. Um, you know, it, it took all of 10 minutes with a power washer to scrub this thing down. Um, this is the brooding end and it's insulated on all sides. Um, and it's where they stay for the first week. It's where the heater is. It's where the uh, water, water hangs in the middle, but the heater's in the, in the uh, brooding end and the feeder's in the brooding end. <coughs> this is the loafing end and it's open on two sides to let the breezes come through. Um, interestingly enough, they seem to spend most of their time down here in the loafing inn where the cool breezes are. Um, it, it's hot in Texas in the summertime. Um, but it, it, you know, it comes apart with these two little clamps 
and uh, the unit's just really well made. Uh, this is my just completed my sixth cycle and it's held up well. It does need a little bit of maintenance in the winter time. Um, you know, a wire wheel and some some uh, paint to keep it from rusting out. Uh, but other than that, you know, these units perform like a charm and I can't say enough good stuff about it. Occasionally you'll have to do some surrogate repair and uh, in this particular case one of the smaller hinges that, that, that came uh, with the surrogate broke and so I installed a, a larger hinge. Uh, so um, just be prepared that you'll have to do some uh, surrogate repair, uh, you know, for sitting out in the weather for eight months out of the year, seven months out of the year. Um, this is a, a very, very sturdy unit, and this is literally the, the first, I guess, semi-major repair that I've had to do on it, uh, other than, um, you know, bring it in in the winter and, and clean it up and buff off the rust and, and repaint it. I keep a supply of everything that I need in my coil buckets. Um, uh, leftover feed. Uh, wipes to clean my hands after I've uh, finished messing with the quail. Uh, a charcoal grill lighter uh, in case the uh, pilot light goes out. Um, my handy zip ties in case I need to replace those on the uh, clamps that hold things together. Um, I have a hammer. You never can tell when you're going to need to pound something in. Um, I have a number of books as well uh, for identifying grasses and forbs um, as part of the ongoing habitat management process. I have a spatula for scraping baby quail out of the dead baby quail out of the bottom of the surrogator. I have an extra set of batteries for my game camera. I have seven dust uh, to spray around the edge. I have my softball that I use for testing uh, different habitat areas. I have a small set of uh, lens cleaners uh, that I use for cleaning the lenses on the game camera. And, and a bunch of other junk. Um, oh, the surveyor flags for uh, marking different locations for habitat improvements or habitat measurements. Uh, and it all fits into a Homer bucket from Home Depot, so I always have whatever I need. I like to keep a cinder block on top of the surrogator, particularly because it had, used to have a little latch there, um, but the uh, latch broke off pretty quickly, and that cinder block kind of ensures that the coons are not going to be able to uh, shear in the uh, wealth of the quail. That's how I use that joint knife or spatula to scrape those dead ones off the bottom of the cage. They'll dry out, get dehydrated, and stick down there pretty hard, and it, it, it can't do the birds any good. To, you know, have a bunch of dead ones rotten in there so it's worthwhile to clean out the dead ones every week but boy they're nasty and I don't want to touch them if I don't have to. You know one of the other things that I make pretty heavy use of on the ranch for the different locations where I'm doing things is a simple GPS and, and uh, mine's a Garmin E-Trex uh, Vista HGX or whatever that means. Uh, I, I use it to mark locations uh, so I've, I've marked all the release locations <coughs> and I've also marked all the habitat management plots and things like that. What I do with it is that I take it and I download it to my computer and then I import those waypoints or marks into a program called Google Earth, uh, which is a stunning program uh, and, and it's free to download from Google. And that gives me a bird's eye view of, of what's, what I'm doing and, and where it lets me see things that I couldn't see standing right here on the ground with respect to where the birds scattering so I'll start marking them as I as I find them find the cubbies later but it'll give me some idea about what I'm doing <coughs> and how effective my location choices are uh, over a period of time and it's, it's pretty simple uh, hold it down mark it type in a name
be location number five. It'll be the fifth different location that I've used on the ranch. And what's that? Highly recommend this as a tool as well. You know, I can't say enough how, how useful an iPad is, and, and as you can see, I, I use it to import the pictures and just use a little camera capture card and this little SD card here. Um, it, it lets me see right away what's happened uh, with the game camera over the past <clears throat> week since I've been out here. I like these inexpensive, uh, are small, I don't want to say inexpensive, this Bushnell model was about $200, but I like it a lot because it runs off of four, uh, sorry, eight AA batteries, and those batteries, you know, they're expensive, they're oh, $3 a piece, but $24 worth of batteries tends to last me almost a year, um, and that's a, a uh, Moultrie tripod that it's mounted on in a Moultrie uh, mounting bracket that it's that it's mounted on it's been customized a little bit but the little game camera has just been it works like a charm it's not as uh, sophisticated as uh, some of the other more powerful game cameras but I'll trade sophistication for reliability we have a bunch of the Moultrie models around the ranch uh, on the deer feeders and man they're they require solar chargers and they're always causing one problem or another and with this little Bushnell model or uh, that you just pop out the SD card, read it into the iPad, pop the card back in, remember to turn it back on, and you're off and going. Here's a quick note about a quail callback device. They're a little bit expensive in my opinion, but uh, they, they, the people that use them say that they work really well. They've got multiple settings, and, and I've got this one to go off like every 30 seconds or so for five or 10 minutes right at dawn and then right again at dusk. Uh, you can set it to you know, call back birds to your Johnny house if you're using released birds uh, for field trials or that kind of thing. <clears throat> I haven't seen that it makes a huge difference, but uh, you can darn sure hear it if you're out here at daylight or at dusk. Um, I'm hoping over the long run something like this will help us out. It's I, I think the what I'm learning from the game of raising wild quail is that it's a it's a game of inches, um, you know, a couple inches every week, and not a game of you know, miles uh, where you, you make one big improvement and it, and it makes a difference. So it's just one more tool in the toolkit to try and get the birds to repopulate and, and uh, breed, nest, and raise babies. You know, I don't know if it does any good, but uh, the guys that have pin raised birds say these things work like a charm to, to call back their uh, release birds that uh, the hunters don't get. So I have one and I uh, put it here by the feeder with the hopes that, you know, every little bit will make a difference. It has several different modes, uh, and the mode that I use is the mode that has it go off at uh, sunrise and then sunset. Every little bit helps. Here's a here's a little modification that I made to the surrogate or watering system that that's proven to be valuable. Uh, we just have a lot of coons out here, and, and I, I wanted to make this as coon proof as possible. And, and so what you see there with the vertical white pipe is that's actually just a cover uh, for a clear pipe. Uh, a, a clear piece of plastic pipe in there that allows you to determine the water level. And uh, my concern was that, that coons and squirrels and such could come gnaw on that very easily. Uh, and even the, the green hose running down to the uh, water nipples themselves. So I covered that up with a simple piece of plastic pipe that I cut an edge in and then just tied it off with a twist tie and you know it's been that way for a year and a half and and served me very well um, never had a leak in the, in the water system and it seems to be relatively well protected um, so that's a little modification that, that you could make um, you know I, I in addition to that the uh, the bungee cords up there and keeping that thing strapped down um, you want to coon proof this thing as much as possible here's another bungee strap around the uh, propane bottle um, you know you're not out here for 
90 95% of the time so you got to make sure that it's it's coon proof and if you got dogs in the area or cats in the area or whatever they're gonna have plenty of time to mess with this thing so um, you know anything you can do to batten down the hatches uh, will certainly make a difference what you see over there in the corner is my homemade quail feeder tester um, trainer uh, what I'm trying to do is condition the birds to um, understand that that tall white thing means food so uh, it's got some chick starter in it uh, the holes probably need to be drilled out the next time I bring the drill and I scatter a little bit of growth starter around that uh, piece of plywood there so that they start to associate the big tall white thing with something to eat they all come back to eat Act like they're starving to death They're not the brightest birds in the world. But they've definitely been using the feeder prototype because it was out of feed. And uh, so th that's, uh, that, that's very, very pleasing. So the first step in setting up the homemade quail feeder is to drive a T-post into the ground. Uh, just enough to keep the feeder tube upright and uh, it takes a good 20 wax or so to drive that t-post into the ground the nice thing is if you have enough t-post you can just leave the t-post at your release spot uh, the next step in setting up the feeder is to take a rake and, and rake away any leaf litter uh, makes the feed easier to find for the chicks um, it doesn't take much but I found that uh, it really makes a big difference if they don't have to dig through the leaves to find the feed now the next step is to set the T-post, uh, the, the feeder tube up next to the T-post. I use two uh, hose clamps, and these are expandable hose clamps from, from McCoy's. Uh, that way I don't have to guess at what size. And I fasten the top one, and I'm also going to use the bottom one to <coughs> excuse me, hold some brackets to uh, uh, hold the protection cage down. Now the next step is to slip the protection cage down over the feeder tube and I use a hammer to pound the corners in and uh, it's not perfect it's still prototype mode and, and I, I tell you what coons can still slip through those uh, little four inch uh, squares there uh, but it seems to keep the deer out of there and uh, you know it will it definitely keeps the hogs out so I got an idea in the works for, for keeping the coons out and uh, we'll work on that Up a little bit so the surrogator works like a charm uh, there's just no two ways about it um, the, the trick to get them to survive is habitat management and you know there's a couple of principles in habitat management one of them that, that we like is you know don't ever start something that you can't uh, sustain over the long run uh, the second one is you know this notion of the minimum effective dose so what's the least amount that you could do that would start producing a return and so this is an example of an area, <coughs> I have uh, one surveyor flag here and then four surveyor flags over there where we've marked out a spot. Uh, we recently cleared the brush back. You can see the cedar or the ash juniper that we cleared back and opened this up to some sunlight and some water. And so we took a small hoe and just carved uh, a little bitty furrows in the ground to see if disturbing the soil, what might come up. And uh, we're in the midst of a pretty bad drought right now. Um, you know a couple inches of rain over the last nine months so I don't expect a whole lot but one of the things that I, I have learned about what we're doing here is is to document everything thoroughly so I have you know on my calendar to come out every two weeks and stand at this spot and take a picture of that so that you know over a year's time or two years time we start to learn something about uh, locations and uh, the, the forms of the plants that may come up here is this a good location is the soil uh, worthwhile what are, what are we learning from this? And it, it's only through a series of pictures or documents and, and um, thoughts over time that you can actually make a good decision about whether or not to continue that practice. And so I'll stand here and, and take my 
every two week picture. And I have three of these places um, in, in kind of different locations where we tried the same thing, which was uh, on bare ground where there weren't any good natural plants. Could we disturb the soil enough to uh, get the natural plants to come back up? And the answer is probably yes, but you know, we hadn't had any rain, so it's, it's tough to say. This is another one of our small habitat management plots, and, and there's a, a, a bit of natural grass in here. But there's this bare ground that we just were wondering about. Why didn't anything grow here? And you can see, well, you probably can't see, but we cut, we took a small hoe and just cut some little bitty furrows in it in a, I don't know, 10 foot by 8 foot plot. Um, just to see if that kind of minor disturbing the ground would make a difference and, and cause the natural seeds that are in the soil to come on up. A little bit bigger plot area and we cut little furrows with the, literally just a little handheld hoe. Um, this one's probably 20 feet by 30 feet on the side and uh, again marked out with surveyor flags so that I could come back and, and take pictures. We were just curious as to why this particular area is surrounded by you know, good natural grasses, even got a few natural grasses in it. Um, this is actually a, a grass called seat muley and uh, this is a, I think is a pretty good indicator that there's water underneath here. Um, folks in this country say that not so much. Um, interestingly enough if you water witch it out the water witches will go crazy over this kind of area here but it's a bare area and, and I was just curious as to why this it also seems to hold water uh, when there's water around because there's this little moss dried moss on top uh, that would that you'd find on the edge of a pond um, so just curious if we you know disturb the soil enough would something come up here we hadn't had any rain so who knows Talk a little bit about habitat management as I'm walking around and trying to put this in. These are what's known as bunch grasses, and uh, they're they're native to Texas, and and uh, they're actually very good. This is a, a little blue stem, and uh, you see why they call them bunch grasses because they they're all bunched up. Um, quail like them. It's good. This is a good quail habitat, even over there up into the trees because there's plenty of bunch grasses, which means that not everything is covered with grass so that gives them the opportunity to move around um, and yet gives them enough cover to uh, have their nest and then brood their babies. Uh, what you see over here is a little experiment that we're doing trying to get rid of some of the non-native grasses and what you you see out there is a grass it's a non-native grass that was planted in the 1950s called King Ranch Blue Stem. And it's still in use today by the highway departments because it, it catches hold quick and, and uh, does well and stops the erosion. And this ranch was uh, solid cedars uh, in the 1950s. And uh, my mother's uncle uh, hired some cedar choppers to come out and, and clear it. And then they hand scattered a lot of this uh, King Ranch blue stem. And uh, it's relatively good for cattle, makes good cattle feed, um, particularly down there where you see the green areas. Uh, the brown areas aren't so good. But it doesn't do so good for wildlife, and, and it's, it's hell to get rid of. So, uh, what we did was we got an old disc and uh, fixed the weights on top of it. And uh, I don't, we don't have a tractor, we used a bobcat. And uh, so, I did an experiment out here with a bobcat and, and drug it around to see what would happen, and used a couple of different approaches. Um, seeing in some places that the natural forbs are coming up um, on two of these lanes I did four lanes out here <clears throat> and on uh, two of them I came back out and hand scattered croton seeds and, and croton is also known as, as dove weed because uh, I had the notion that there's plenty of dove around here and uh, I had the notion that it would be nice to sit back up there under the shade of a tree and have a patch full of dove weed out here that the doves came to um, but I, I see that we, we are having some success there's a uh, so the that's deer pea vetch um, which is one of the first ones to come up and you see it's it's coming up in the areas that have, that have been disturbed much much more than uh, the areas that haven't been disturbed so here's a little bit more of it here uh, that, that's a good sign. Um, the really, really green one down there is a plant called uh, Queen's Delight. And uh, there's a bunch of it. It seems to be a real hardy plant 
Uh, here's an example. Real hardy plant produces a good seed head, and it's the only thing that's green out here, um, which is kind of surprising. Um, but you know, just great evidence that that dragging a disc across the ground will disturb the natural seeds that are in the ground and uh, have the plants. Um, we had a little bit of rain out here a couple of weeks ago, and the reason I've got this one tagged up here is I think it might be dubweed. I'm I'm not sure but I want to watch it pretty closely and, and uh, see what happens with it. So again, on the habitat management, it's just, you know, try a little bit and see what happens. Just, you know, think ahead of time. Is this something that I'll be able to sustain? And, and you know, would, would we be able to sustain the disking out here? Ah, I, I don't know. Uh, but, you know, the question we're trying to ask is, you know, what type of disking um, our disking program might knock back the King Ranch blue stem so that we could start a program of, of pushing that back. Uh, as you can see, there's a, there's a lot of pasture out there where the King Ranch blue stem, the green stuff, is pretty thick. Uh, and and uh, Sir would like to convert that back to natural grasses because uh, the, the quail will start. Dr. Dale Rollins talks about a, a quail softball test, and, and I like it a lot and use it quite a bit uh, in determining you know, how good is the habitat, and particularly for you know, raising wild quail and releasing them from a surrogator, do they have good habitat pretty close by? Uh, they're going to migrate out over time once you release them, and, and uh, they'll actually surprise you in how far that they'll move away from where they were originally released. But my biggest concern is in that first week or two that they're released, uh, they really don't know a whole lot, and, and they've, they, while they've been exposed to predators, they haven't been predated on. So I <clears throat> want to make sure that wherever we put the, the surrogator to, uh, for those first five weeks that we're raising them, that when we release them, that it's a good location for them to have some immediate habitat and coverage. And there's a number of different points that he makes about habitat, but there's, there, there's, there's two that I think are, are most important when you're releasing them quickly. So uh, he uses the notion of a, of a softball field. And so, is there a quail house uh, within a softball throw? So that if they're out feeding or something like that, that they can get to cover quickly. And if you've hunted quail, then, then you know that you know, they're gonna fly about, I don't know, 50 yards, 75 yards. Uh, I can't throw a softball that far. But you know, can, you, can you throw a softball from one quail house to another? And, and there's a quail house right beside me here, and, and the surrogator release area is not more than you know, 20 steps over in that direction. But if we released them in this area, you know, could they get to, if they were out here feeding, uh, number one, is it a good area for them to feed? Well, there's, there's good native grasses here. They can get around. If you roll a softball, you can see that they can move around pretty easily. And, and that's a benefit, because if you toss the ball, and it doesn't roll, then the quail can't move. But you can see if the softball rolls anywhere from six inches to six feet, according to what Dale says, then that's pretty good ground cover. Uh, it's enough for them to be able to squirt around on the ground because as we all know, quail would rather run than fly. Now I'm gonna throw the softball and, and see what happens. But I, I think if you throw the softball, can they, can they get to cover? Yeah, I think so. So that's a good test, you know, is it, can you throw a softball from one quail house to the next? Um, and he defines a quail house as a, you know, piece of brush that's about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle, um, thick on top so that they can hide from any flying raptors and clear enough underneath in the bottom so that they can uh, see predators coming in from the side. Now I gotta go get the softball. So the surrogator is made up of two ends. Uh, this is the brooding end and it is uh, solid on three sides. Um, it has a mesh bottom as you can see and it's got an attachment there to mount the heating device. <clears throat> and it attaches to the loafing end uh, with a set of clamps right there, little hooks that hook underneath the top bar of the loafing end, <clears throat> and then uh, two little clamps on the ends uh, that hold the two together, and there you can see the nipple watering device. The surrogator is 44 inches wide, and each half is uh, 40 inches long and it is 16 inches high. Uh, as you can see, it's got handles on, on this end 
Uh, and again, this is the brooding end uh, to make it easier to transport. The brooding end also has a bar in the middle that allows you to uh, mount the cover as well as the flyout preventers. It's important to note that the, the sides and the end of the, the brooding end of the surrogator uh, appear to be insulated, uh, somewhat solid. Uh, what we're looking for in the brooding end of the surrogator is heat containment uh, and protection from wind. The feed container sits inside of the brooding end of the surrogator, mounts exactly in there, and uh, uh, with the food tray right at the bottom of the quarter inch or three eighths inch uh, chicken wire uh, hardware cloth floor. The floor is mounted, uh, the wire floor is mounted about two inches uh, above the ground and I, I think that's important. I, I have found snakes uh, and mice uh, that will live up underneath the, the surrogator out in the field and uh, try and nibble on the chicks. There's a little uh, rest on this top bar that holds these flyout preventers uh, and that, that's what they are so that you're able to uh, open the lid and not have the chicks uh, fly off. These are uh, the, the short side uh, flyout preventers and they're just uh, stiff expanded metal uh, to keep the chicks in there when you need to, to fill the feeder uh, or uh, slide one back and, and the handy part is that they slide from side to side and allow you to get uh, selective access in there to, to clean out the dead chicks as needed. The long side flyout preventers again thin in a little notch on that crossbar and uh, they're also notched out in the corner for the brace uh, and they're bent a little bit uh, so that they're able to hang right there on the edge. Uh, the advantage is that that, that, allows, that allows the flyout preventers to slide side to side and give you easy access uh, for whatever you're doing. The nipple water is, is made out of a small piece of PVC. Uh, a couple of things important to note, the, the, the nipples aren't complicated. I've seen them uh, advertised on the internet. Um, and then they're, they're hung from this little bracket uh, that, that loosens right here. Uh, I can loosen it. There we go. Uh, so this loosens up with a, a little uh, keyed nut that allows you to adjust the height and then tighten it back up. Uh, one of the important aspects is to always make sure that the water is uh, the water nipples are head height to the chicks. Um, a, a little uh, oh nipple fitting down there to connect to the water tank, as well as uh, what I think is an important part and been stressed a couple of times. This is a, a drain valve. So that when you do fill the water or if it ever runs out of water and you refill it, this allows you to uh, open this little stopcock and drain out any uh, air so that the, the nipples will work. And in, in the field, I always test the nipples by uh, tapping on them to make sure that they're still flowing freely. The nipple water is connected to the water tank with a uh, short piece of hose. But again, it's, it's important that uh, the water be adjustable so that you can uh, put the nipples right at the beak height of the chicks on a weekly basis. The top for the brooding end of the surrogator uh, folds about in half and, I, and I, it, it folds right along uh, that little uh, bar right there. So allow you to lift up uh, one half of the brooding end or the other half of the brooding end. Uh, it's, uh, the top is hinged in the middle and, and I want to stress again that the top is insulated as well. This is, a, this is pretty heavy. Uh, it's got a uh, little latch there, a little rubber latch there that, that connects over to a latch right here. Uh, and, and that's really just the weight and, and everything that, that keeps the surrogator lid on it. Uh, never had any problem with it uh, coming off or being disturbed or anything. As you see with the top uh, installed on the brooding end and uh, it's fitted, 
so that there's insulation on the inside, but there's a channel around it that, that goes around the outside. So it's, it's somewhat fitted. And again, that uh, the top is uh, reinforced and insulated. And that's what the top looks like closed over. So uh, you can open that half and, and, uh, or latch it and uh, the chicks are protected on all sides there. Uh, if need be, where my quail dog? Uh, if need be, you can come in and raise back this other half and uh, get into the uh, surrogator there as well. The surrogator comes with the heating unit and this is it. Um, it's uh, round on this end and I, I don't have a ceramic disc, but there's a ceramic disc that fits uh, in this rest area right here that uh, redirects the heat downwards. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward little unit. Um, it's got a uh, an igniter in there just like you find in any uh, uh, barbecue pit and uh, keeps the pilot lit going. And it's it's wired back here to what appears to be a, a, a temperature regulator of some sort. I, I'm not a gas engineer, so I don't know. The red button is for the igniter. Um, the igniter doesn't always work for me. I tend to use a, a, a regular old lighter. Uh, it's got a temperature gauge on the top of it. Um, and I do not know how it's calibrated. And then it's got the, the main shut off here for uh, pilot light on to light the pilot. Uh, and then to turn it on and turn it off completely. Uh, again, I'm, I, I don't know how these things work uh, or where you'd uh, find or build a unit like this one. Um, I suspect that you could buy the heating unit uh, directly from the guys at Wildlife Management. Uh, there is a thermostat right there um, because uh, that's important uh, in turning the, the gas flow on or off as the temperature may change. The unit mounts with this little hole right here. and. Uh, simply hangs on on that little uh, bracket down there. And that's a shot of the, the heating unit uh, inside of the surrogator hanging on the bracket with the hose running up. Uh, the hose runs uh, through the dividing unit and out a special hole in the loafing end. Uh, and again, the, it's important to remember that, that the heating unit also includes a ceramic disc uh, that fits over the top of it which redirects the heat back downwards to keep the chicks warm. Otherwise, you'd just be heating the top of the surrogator, possibly even burn the top of the surrogator out. The other half of the surrogator is the loafing end, and, and uh, it's uh, open on two sides, has the same uh, 3 8 inch mesh on, on the bottom of it. <clears throat> There's a special little uh, doorway on one side if you want to allow the chicks to come and go after their fifth or sixth week. I, I never have. I always uh, empty the chicks out and uh, uh, move the surrogator. Uh, but some folks uh, put a narrow little uh, possum and coon proof door there so that the chicks can come back into the surrogator. I haven't noticed that that's uh, beneficial. <clears throat> It's worthwhile to note on the loafing in that there is no insulation because the purpose here is to allow them to enjoy the breezes. Um, you'll see a, a divider that's folded down right now in the middle. The purpose of that divider uh, is to keep the chicks locked up in the brooding in for the first week or two uh, until they're not so heat dependent and then let them out into the loafing in. Uh, the, the top does not remove from the loafing end, nor does the loafing end have any fly-out preventers. Uh, so if you open this end, uh, you've got to be, be careful that uh, the chicks don't fly out. That said, um, boy, 49 out of 50 chicks that die in the surrogator all die down there in the, in the brooding end and not here in the loafing end. I almost never have to open this loafing end uh, except you know at the end of the surrogator cycle. Uh, it's all made out of thin aluminum and of course reinforced with uh, a little bit of uh, three quarter inch square uh, pipe. As you see it's, it's uh, mesh on, on two sides. Uh, it's, it's solid on the end. Another aspect of the loafing end is it's also uh, open on top uh, but not horribly so because it's got these two brackets where a 15 gallon uh, water tank fits and those are my bungee cords for holding the water tank. Um, it has a uh, small uh, hole, covered hole here 
uh, and that allows you to run the heating unit uh, hose out uh, to a uh, propane tank. The divider is really simple. Uh, it's in the down position right now, and uh, I usually keep it down for the first week, uh, and then you open it up, and, and it's, it's simply got a way to, some holes punched in the mesh there to keep it up. Um, and there's room for them to get up. They'll get up on top of that divider, but as you can see, the uh, divider is uh, open, and you can see the corresponding latches here on either side, uh, they correspond to the, the latches here, uh, which holds the unit together. So these uh, hooks uh, uh, mesh up underneath the, the pipe here, the square pipe here, and then you simply fold it down and latch it with these, latch these little latches here uh, against their corresponding uh, parts over here, and that, that holds the two halves of the surrogated together. Uh, a little bit of a bracket there to stabilize the 15 gallon water tank. Uh, this is an example of the two surrogator halves hooked together. Uh, one's been connected to the other and then the uh, catch engaged here. Um, it's, it's, really, I, it's really handy to have uh, the surrogator separate into two halves if you're going to be moving it and doing a lot of cycles and, and don't have a whole lot of help. By being able to break it into two halves, I'm able to load it into the back, the entire rig into the back of a pickup with the help of my 11-year-old uh, daughter, and uh, she and I can get the whole thing done. Otherwise, I'd need uh, to haul a trailer out there and have another man help me lift it and horse it around. Um, <coughs> the loafing end is not very heavy, but the, the brooding end is heavy uh, with the, all the insulation that it has. The 15 gallon water tank sits like so and uh, the, the hose feeds down through the top of the loafing end and then a, a, across through a little hole in the uh, divider and then goes on down and connects directly to the nipple water. Uh, that same hole is used to run the uh, hose out for the heating unit and it goes out there and then comes back up through the top here and connects to your external propane tank. So the surrogator unit is about four feet wide. It separates into two units, uh, each about three and a half feet long. Uh, they join together to make the total length about seven feet. And it's about 16 inches tall. Um, it's got a floor on, in it uh, that uh, raises the chicks off the ground by about uh, two inches. Um, Got a, a built-in feeding uh, feed trough. It's got uh, a heating unit uh, with a ceramic uh, disc to redirect the heat. Um, the brooding end is insulated all the way around to protect them and, and keep the heat in until they're till they reach about a week or two. Um, the loafing end is open on two sides plus half the top. <clears throat> Doesn't have any flyout preventer. Uh, carries the 15 gallon water tank. Uh, one piece on the water tank, I've actually covered it up. That's a, a clear piece of uh, pipe so that you can see the depth of the water. Uh, I found that just with the out and bright sunshine you can see the depth of the water and I didn't want coons coming up and uh, chewing through that hose and draining out all my water so I wrapped another little piece of plastic pipe around it to keep the coons away. Um, Got a little neck and a cap for the, to, to fill the water. Uh, the nipple water is made out of uh, PVC with readily available nipples. Um, the important part is that it's got uh, an, an air bleed valve in one end uh, to make sure that when you fill it initially that uh, it, it fills with water all the way through. And it's got a height adjustment because you do need to pay attention and, and adjust the height uh, every week. Last but not least, and probably one of the handiest things, they put a wildlife management technologies put a schedule on here to tell you what to do at the uh, start of each week and the end of each week, uh, and a nice uh, uh, phone number to get in touch with them. They've always been real responsive. Uh, at the start of week one, make sure the divider is in the down position. Adjust, uh, place the ground feed and chick aid on rough paper plates. Uh, that's to allow them to easily uh, get to uh, the feed, uh, adjust the watering height to the chick's eye level and set the temperature to five. 
at the end of week one, move the divider into the up position so that they can get to the loafing area, change the temperature setting from five to three, check the water level in the barrel, adjust the water height to the chick's eye level, remove the dead and remove the paper plates. At the end of week two, change the temperature setting from three to one, check the water level in the barrel, adjust the water height and remove the dead. End of week three, if nighttime temperatures are consistently above 60, turn off the propane and remove the ceramic disc. Uh, remove the heater assembly and the plug the hole with the attached uh, cover. Check the water level, check and stir the feed, uh, adjust the watering height to chick's eye level and remove the dead. And end of week four, check the water level in the barrel, adjust the water height to chick's eye level, remove the dead, check and stir the feed. If using pheasants, four weeks is the end of the cycle. End of week five, if using quail, five weeks is the end of the cycle. And uh, be sure to read your instruction manual for detailed instructions on proper cycle maintenance and release. All in all, you know, it, this is one hell of a unit. I, I think all in it cost about uh, $2,000, $2,500. And uh, I've used this one for two years, run seven or eight cycles through it, and plan to use it for another three to five years and continuing to run cycles and, and growing my birds.